Hey guys, I'm pretty excited about this one. One of the things I've always loved about Brilliant is how it takes complicated concepts and breaks it down into easy to understand lessons. So when I saw that they had a course on how AI works, I had to check it out. So far, I've gone through about 12 of the lessons and I'm already starting to understand how AI breaks down language. It's fun to see the logic of it come to life. So I wanted to put a video together to share what I've done so far. It starts out by letting you play with the rudimentary language model. It's basic logic and it's trained on a small data set. The conversation isn't really coherent and you can see that the same word will give different outputs. So you end up with different results every time. And the results are basically nonsense. And for some words, it doesn't even give an output. So what is going on here? It only has a one word look back. So when we said the word the corresponding came out and then to choose the next word, it only looked at corresponding and came up with counterclaim. And then to do the next word, it only looked at counterclaim and chose account. So that's why it was just a bunch of words and not really clear sentences because the look back was super short. And then the reason why some words didn't have any output was if I chose a word that was not in the terms and conditions, it would give no output. So this was an example of a very rudimentary language model. Somehow we got to get from here to something that feels like it's having a real conversation with us. Let's see what's next. Oh, and I really like these. For some of these lessons, they have skill checks at the end. So it just gave you a chance to make sure you understood everything that was going on. So in the next lesson, I thought this was a fun example. It says it's a one word context. So it's only looking back one word. And it says, assume the corpus is a wide range of text. The corpus is the data that you use to make the model. So there's just a wide range of texts. For this one, it feels like we would say, my name is Emma is the one that makes the most sense. But all this model is doing is looking at the word is. So in that wide range of texts, which of these words do we think is the most common to follow after the word is? And the answer should be the. So the was the correct answer. We haven't looked at the actual data, but it makes sense that the word the would show up after the word is more often than Emma would show up. And then here's a fun one. Jupiter is a blank. So you totally want to say planet, but for the same thing, what's most likely to follow after the word a? So the, I don't think would follow after a planet or time. I feel like time is probably probably more often following after A, I'd feel like planet's a less common of a word. So I could see this going either way, but I bet you for this one, the answer is probably time. And yeah, ended up being time. So Jupiter is a time is kind of silly, but if you realize it's only looking back one word, this could make sense. And then here's one more, my pet mouse is, and then adorable and furry both make sense for this one. But once again, we're only going back one word. So I'm guessing big is a more common word so it would probably show up more often after the word is, and it ends up being big. So clearly looking back one word is not enough. So then in the next section, they use four gram models, and a four gram model looks back at the previous three words. So the output will always be the fourth word of a set of three. So in this case, my name is, I bet you Mason is the most likely to show up after my name is. And same thing here, Jupiter is A, it's gotta be planet is the most likely to show up in this case. And then this one's fun, they switched it to a trigram model. That means it's gonna give you the third word of a set of two. So the capital of France is, we feel like we wanna say Paris, but we're only looking at the words France and is. So France is Paris, France is in, or France is Shanghai. I bet you in is the one that shows up the most in that case. So trigram probably isn't long enough. If we would have gone back just a couple more words, we would have saw the word capital, and I'm pretty sure then it would have selected Paris. So then in the next section, we start to see some data. So we're not just guessing. They're giving you the counts of all of these bigrams, which is combinations of two words next to each other. Showed up 1,675 times. And of the showed up next to each other 1,338 times. And these are all the most common sets of two words next to each other. So now we want to finish this up. Fry the vegetables in. Well, in the was the highest one, so it's gotta be the, and that's right. Okay, so this one's kind of fun. It says prepare the sauce, butter, or casserole. I don't see sauce, butter, or casserole up here. So we're gonna have to scroll down, look for the word the. I wanna find the first one that follows after the, and here's sauce. So it looks like sauce is the most common of these three to follow after the, so we plug that in. And I like this, you could see literally what the machine's doing. It's going down the list and finding the most common one. So the answer to this question is restricted by these three words. I don't think an AI model would restrict the three possible outputs, but I still thought this was a good question to visualize how this works. So these are called n-gram models. They're based on sets of words grouped together. One of the downsides of increasing your look back too far is if you have like five or six words for your input, if those six words aren't in that exact order, Order, 
you're not going to get any output. So that was another issue they needed to fix with these AI models, is you have to be able to look back a bunch of words, but the words don't have to be in that exact same order. And they go into more detail, but that's basically a high-level summary of these first four lessons. And then in this next section, we have temperature. Temperature was really interesting. Let's check it out. So when the model is set to a high temperature setting, it won't automatically choose the highest probability word to do next. I think it looks at the collection of all the possible outputs. It doesn't give much value to whatever one has the highest probability. It almost just outputs random. And then if you go to a very low temperature setting, it will always give the word that's the highest probability. And that's usually much more coherent and consistent. With the low temperature, you're going to get basically the same output every single time. And there's a fun vocab word for that. If the same input will give the same output every single time, that's called deterministic. It's kind of like the idea of a function. One input will always give the same output. And that'll happen when the model's temperature is set to low. So it might feel like you want to have the temperature set as low as possible. Possible. If you want poetry or something creative, you got to give it a little bit of temperature so you can have some variety in the words it'll choose. And to find the exact setting you want is probably a lot of trial and error. It's kind of interesting. So there's some AI engineer out there that's just changing the setting little by little and watching what it outputs and seeing where it likes it the most. So the next section is called improving models. I think this was about doing multiple passes through the data. Let's check it out. And here's another vocab word. I don't know how to say it. Epoch or epic. It's the official word for one run through the data. So in this particular model, one pass through the data gives us this right here. And this just gives complete nonsense every time. And then we have a chance to look at one that has a thousand runs through the data. So now we're looking at real words. It feels more real, but if you read it, it doesn't really mean anything. But if you look at one with over 100,000 runs, now we're starting to make sense. So it's not perfect yet, but it's much better than those other ones. So the more runs through the data, the better it's going to get. Eventually, you hit a point of diminishing returns where every run, the model does not get noticeably better. And if you go too far, it ends up overfitting the model. And then you've basically just created something that's a word lookup. It no longer has the conversation ability. It's literally just giving you exact copies of the original data. So you don't want to go too far with it. You definitely got to figure out where the sweet spot is. So the next three lessons were pre-processing, capitalization, and punctuation. It gave an example of something like capital M versus lowercase m. The model does not think of those both as M, where one's capital, one's lowercase. It thinks of them as separate things. And stuff like punctuation, it has no idea what a comma means or a period or any of the punctuation. So this goes over how things can get very complex very easily, and smaller models with smaller data might have to choose to ignore the capitalization if they want to actually create something readable. It's a lot for me to try to explain in this video, but it was interesting what they did in these three. And this next one on tokenization, it was pretty cool too. It's about breaking words up into smaller parts that the model can understand. So here they have starting, started, and start exclamation mark. It breaks it up into start and ing, start and ed, and start and exclamation mark. And by viewing these separately, it's able to save space and generalize better. And modern AI systems use flexible algorithms that can automatically find the most efficient way to split things up. It's hard to explain quickly. They do a pretty good job here going through it. And the next one, this byte pair encoding, it's also pretty interesting. Sometimes it's not optimal to keep all the letters separate. If there's two letters that show up together a lot, the system actually prefers to think of them as one thing. So it gives examples like EM or IN. Those show up a lot in words. The model's actually better off if it groups those two letters letters together as their own letter. And it makes the model more efficient than if it treated them separately. And I just got started on level three, this deep networks. That's kind of fun. They give us three different models where we get to draw numbers. The first one is totally random. So when I draw a five, it gives us two. When I draw a four, it outputs two. When I do an eight, it outputs two. I wonder if I can get something other than two. There we go. So that gives me an eight. So this is a very poorly put together model. And then you have one that the difference is it's been trained on 10,000 examples. So let's try zero. It recognizes a little bit percent of zero, but it's mostly getting four out of this, which I guess I can see that. This looks like a four right here. And now it's giving us eight. So it's clearly eight for that. Oh, what does six do? So we get six, nine. So nine, yeah, it looks like a four or a nine. So you can see what would happen if you did it on 10,000 examples. And then down here, they have one, they do it on a lot more examples. This is 200,000 examples. So zero gives me zero. And if I do it in the corner, okay, it calls that two. And then if I draw a one, it says one. And can I give it a little hat? Okay, so it thinks that's a two. So here's two and then three, five. And you'll notice as I was working on the five, it actually had a really strong seven right there, but then it became a five. 
Oh, now it's viewing three. So it's not perfect yet, but it's much closer than those other ones were. So it's definitely cool to see how it gets progressively better as you run it through these processes. And that's as far as I've gotten for now. So I still got a lot to go through. I'm excited to see what all this is gonna be about, but I have a much better understanding of what's going on under the hood. How exciting. And if you wanna go through these yourself, these go through way more detail than what I just did. The name of the course is How AI Works and it's on brilliant.org. If you wanna check it out yourself, visit brilliant.org slash brilliantandymath or scan the QR code on the screen, or you can click on the link in the description. How exciting.